Hello, and welcome back to chapter 3 of uh, Man and Technics by Oswald Spengler. The Origin of Man, Hand and Tool. The, it's going to be a rather short chapter, so I will try something new this time. Um, I'm going to try to take it a lot slower. Sometimes maybe even um, silently read a sentence before I then uh, speak it out loud. Because I've noticed in the uh, previous recordings, I tried to like go on and on, like sentence by sentence, reading word for word, and I messed up the intonation and the pronunciation of some words, and then I had to repeat them, the sentences again, and it, it didn't sound that good. Um, so I'll try to take it slower. Maybe that will make me a lot less nervous, hopefully. And yeah, we'll see how that goes. All right, five. Since when has this type of inventive carnivore existed? Or what comes to the same thing? Since when have there been men? What is man? And how did he come to be man? The answer is through the genesis of the hand. Here is a weapon unparalleled in the world of free-moving life. Compared with the paw, the beak, the horns, teeth, and tail fins of other creatures. To begin with, the sense of touch is concentrated in it to such a degree that it can almost be called the organ of touch, in the sense that the eye is the organ of vision and the ear of hearing. It distinguishes not only hot and cold, solid and liquid, hard and soft, but above all, weight, form, and position of re resistances, etc. In short, things in space. But over and above this function, the activity of living is gathered into it so completely that the whole bearing and allure of the body has, simultaneously, taken shape in accordance with it. There is nothing in the whole world that can be set beside this member, capable equally of touch and action. To the eye of the beast of prey which regards the world, theoretically, is added the hand of man which commands it practically. Its origins must have been sudden. In terms of the tempo of cosmic currents, it must have happened like everything else that is decisive in world history, epoch-making in the highest sense, as abruptly as a flash of lightning or an earthquake. Here again we have to emancipate ourselves from the 19th century idea, based on Liel's geological researches, of an evolutionary process. Such a slow, phlegmatic alteration is truly appropriate to the English nature, but it does not represent nature. To support the theory, since measurable periods disclose no such process, time has been flung about in millions of years. But in truth, we cannot distinguish geological strata unless catastrophes of unknown kinds and sources have separated them for us. Nor yet species or fossil creatures unless they appear suddenly and hold an unaltered till there unless they appear suddenly and hold on unaltered till their extinction of the ancestors of man we know nothing in spite of all our research and comparative anatomy the human skeleton has been ever since it appeared just what it is now one can observe even the Neanderthal type in any public gathering. It is impossible, therefore, that hand, upright, gait, the position of the head, 
and so forth should have developed successively and independently. The whole thing hangs together and suddenly is. World history strides on from catastrophe to catastrophe, whether we can comprehend and prove the fact or not. Nowadays, since de Vries, we call it mutation. It is an inner change that suddenly seizes all specimens of genus, of course, without rhyme or reason, like everything else in actuality. It is the mysterious rhythm of the real. Further, not only must man's hand, gait and posture have come into existence together, but, and this is a point that no one hitherto has observed, hand and tool also. The unarmed hand is in itself useless. It requires a weapon to become itself a weapon. As the implements took form from the shape of the hand, so also the hand from the shape of the tool. It is meaningless to attempt to divide the two chronologically. It is impossible that the formed hand was active, even for a short time, without the implement. The earliest remains of man and of his tools are equally old. What has divided, however, not chronologically, but logically, the te is the technical process, so that the making and the using of the tool are different things. As there is a technique of violin making and another of violin playing, so there is a technique of shipbuilding and another of sailing. The bowyer's craft and the archer's skill. No other pr no other praying animal even selects its weapon, but man not only selects it, but makes it, and according to his own individual ideas, and with this, let's read that again, no other praying animal even selects its weapon, but man not only s selects it, but makes it, and according to his own individual ideas, and with this he obtains a terrific superiority in the struggle with his own kind and other beasts and with nature. This is what constitutes his liberation from the compulsion of the genus, a phenomenon unique in the history of all life on this planet. With this man comes into being. He has made his active life to a large extent free of the conditions of his body. The genus instinct still preserves in full strength, but there has detached itself the thought and intelligent action of the individual, which is independent of the genus. This freedom consists in freedom of choice. Everyone makes his own weapon according to his own skill and his own reasoning. The vast hordes of misshaped and rejected pieces that we find are eloquent of the... Uh, hmm. Let's read that again. The vast horde, hordes of misshaped and rejected pieces that we find are eloquent of the carefulness of this original thinking doing. If, nevertheless, these pieces are so similar that one can, though with doubtful justification, deduce the existence of distinguishable cultures such as Acheulean and Salutrian, and even postulate therefrom, this certainly without justification, time parallels in all the five continents, the explanation lies in the fact that this liberation from the compulsion of the genus only emanated at first as a grand possibility and fell far short of any actualized individualism. Now that is a, that is one sentence. <laughs> I don't know. That is a thing with the um, German, German writers there. They really like long sentences. 
and when you're at the end of the sentence you don't know what you've read in the beginning anymore it's, n it's really not that I don't like it too much but let's move on no one likes to pose as a freak nor on the other hand merely to imitate another in fact everyone thinks and works for himself but the life of the genus is so powerful that in spite of this the product is everywhere similar as it is at bottom even today so besides the thought of the eye the comprehending and keen glance of the great beasts of prey we have now the thought of the hand from the former in the meantime has developed the thought that is theoretical observant com contemplative our reflection and wisdom and now from the latter comes the practical active thought our cunning and intelligence proper the eye seeks to cause the eye seeks out cause and effect the hand works on the principle of means and end the question of whether something is suitable or unsuitable the criterion of the doer has nothing to do with that of true and false the value of the observer the values of the observer and an aim is a fact while a connection connection uh, connection I don't know that word and an aim is a fact while a connection of cause and effect is a truth in this wise arose the very different modes of thought and of truth men the priest the scholar the philosopher and the fact man the statesman the general and the merchant ever since then even today ever since then today even the commanding directing clenching hand is the expression of a will so much that we have actually a graphol graphology and palmistry not to mention figures of speech such, a, such as the heavy hand of the conqueror the dexterity of the financier and the hand revealed to in the work of a criminal or an artist with his hand his weapon and his personal thinking man became creative all that animals do remains inside the limits of the genus activity and does not enrich life at all man however the creative animal has spread such a wealth of inventive thought and action all over the world that he seems perfectly entitled to call his to call his brief history world history and to regard his entourage as humanity with all the rest of nature as a background an object and a means the act of the thinking hand we call a deed there is already activity in the existence of the animals but deeds begin only with man nothing is more enlightening in this connection than the story of fire man sees cause and effect how a fire starts and so also do many of the beasts but man alone end and means thinks out a process of starting it no other act so impresses us with the sense of creation as this one one of the most uncanny violent enigmatic phenomena of nature lightning forest fire volcano is henceforth called into life by man himself against nature what it must have been to a man's soul that first sight of a fire evoked by himself and now part six let's see yeah that's only three pages under the mighty impress of this free and conscious single act which thus emerges from the uniformity of the impulsive and collective genus activity 
The genuine human soul now forms a very solitary soul, even as compared with those of other beasts of prey. With the proud and pensive look of one knowing his own destiny, with the unrestrained sense of power in the first habituate, habituate, habituated, oh, it's fist, never mind. Let's read that again. Um, where does the sentence start? It's incredible. Uh, under the mighty impress of this free and conscious single act, which thus emerges from the uniformity of the impulsive and collective genus activity, the genuine human soul now forms a very solitary soul, even as compared with those of other beasts of prey, with the proud and pensive look of one knowing his own destiny, with unrestrained sense of power, in the fist habituated to deeds, a foe to everyone, killing, hating, res resolute to conquer or die. This soul is profounder and more passionate than that of any animal whatsoever. It stands in irre irreconcilable opposition to the whole world, from which its own creativeness has sundered it. It is the soul of an upstart. Earliest man settled alone like a bird of prey. If several families drew together into a pact, into a pack, it was a pack of the loosest sort, as yet there is no thought of tribes, let alone peoples. The pack, to, the pack is a chance assembly of a few males who for once do not fight one another, with their women and the children of their women without communal feeling and wholly free. They are not a we like the mere herd of specimens of a genus. The soul of these strong solitaries is warlike through and through, mistrustful, jealous of its own power and booty. It knows the intoxication of feeling when the knife pierces the hostile body, and the smell of blood and the sense of amazement strike together upon an upon the ex exultant soul. Every real man, even in the cities of late periods in the cultures, feels in himself from time to time the sleeping fires of this primitive soul. Nothing here of the pitiful estimation of things as useful or labor-saving, and less still of the toothless feeling of sympathy and reconciliation and yearning for quiet, but instead of these the full pride of knowing oneself feared, admired, and hated for one's fortune and strength, and the urge to vengeance upon all, whether living beings or things, that constitute, if only by their mere existence, a threat to this pride. And this soul strides forward in an ever-increasing alienation from all nature. The weapons of the beasts of prey are natural, but the armed fist of man with its artificially made, thought out and selected weapon is not. Here begins art as a counter-concept to nature. Every technical process of man is an art and is always so described. So, for instance, archery and equitation, the art of war, the arts of building and government, of sacrificing and prophesying, of painting and versification, of scientific experiment. Every work of man is artificial, unnatural, from the, lightning, from the lighting of a fire to the achievements that are specifically designated as artistic in the high cultures. The privilege of creation has been wrestled from nature. Free will itself is an act of rebellion and nothing less. Creative man has stepped outside the bounds of nature, and with every fresh creation he departs further and further from her, becomes more and more her enemy. That, it, that is his world history. 
the history of a steadily increasing, fateful rift between man's world and the universe. The history of a rebel that grows up to raise his hand against his mother. This is the beginning of man's tragedy, for nature is the stronger of the two. Man remains dependent on her, for in spite of everything she embraces him, like all else within herself. All the great cultures are defeats. Whole races remain inwardly destroyed and broken, fallen into barrenness and spiritual decay, as corpses on the field. The fight against nature is hopeless, hopeless and yet it will be fought out to the bitter end. I will read that sentence again. The fight against nature is hopeless, and yet it will be fought out to the bitter end. And that concludes chapter 3. In two days, I will upload chapter 4, which is going to be a pretty long one. And yeah, at that point will be two-thirds of the way through. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you in two days. Bye.